So I'm going to share today a few different things. One is the scope that the Mortensen Center is attempting to help make a contribution to. So the scope of global poverty uh, in the world today and the role that engineers can play in trying to alleviate uh, these challenges of poverty in low and middle income countries. And then more specifically, some of the work we do at the Mortensen Center, and more specifically than that, the particular work my research group does and, and has, do, has done and will be doing going forward. So here we are, looks pretty familiar. Uh, what's cool about this is it's actually, it's a series of pictures, it's not a graphic. It's a, every place on earth on a cloud free day, but it looks pretty familiar. So here's another way of looking at the planet. Just humor me, what do you see here? What does that tell us? People. People, rich people, yeah. right? We see us, we see Europe, we see India emerging, China emerging. Uh, that's the Nile, but you see most of Sub-Saharan Africa essentially in the dark. So here's another way of looking at the planet. What are these? Fires, right? Some of these are forest fires, but most of these are cook stoves. Three billion people in the world still use biomass, so wood and charcoal, on open campfires for their daily energy needs. And respiratory disease associated with indoor and outdoor air pollution, of which biomass burning is a major contributor to the global burden of disease. Five million children die every year from respiratory disease. We still have two billion people in the world without safe sanitation. There's still pretty much a billion people that don't have access to clean water. The official number is, is lower than that. It's like 700 million, but the real number is closer to a billion when you look at actual service delivery and quality of delivered water. And 99% of the children who die under the age of five every year were born in a low-income country. So these are issues of air quality, water quality, sanitation, and safe energy access in developing countries that still exist today. There's another way of looking at the planet. These are aerosols. So these are sandstorms, and these are biomass aerosols. This is a snapshot of one, one day on the planet. And while the trend in overall in the world is, a, is positive, people are getting healthier and wealthier, there's more stability, uh, there's fewer number, both proportionally and absolute number of people without access to clean water, safe sanitation, or energy. In some of the areas of the world, things are actually getting worse, uh, attributable to climate change. In East Africa, there's 30% less water annually now than historic norms. So drought, which used to be every 10 or 15 or 20 years, is now nearly every year in the Horn of Africa, uh, attributable to climate change. Malaria is a parasite that lives in mosquitoes. It's killed more people in human history than any other cause, respiratory disease, diarrhea, war, anything else. Malaria, hands down, has killed more human beings. And the one saving grace of malaria is that it was too cold for the parasite to survive in mosquitoes above about five or 6,000 feet. So there are population centers like Nairobi, Kenya, that came into being because people observed that you weren't dying of malaria there anymore. And now, just within the pi past five years, there's persistent and chronic malaria in Nairobi. So we actually have disease patterns changing attributable to climate change. This is uh, another way of looking at the planet. It's the world population proportional to land mass. Looks pretty familiar, so not a lot of discussion there, although you, of course, see India and China with a billion people each uh, jumping out. And then you have economic growth over the last quarter of the 20th century. And you see most of Africa almost entirely disappears. Most LDCs, least developed countries, are in sub-Saharan Africa still today. And you see Europe and Asia and the United States and North America growing. Similar to economic growth are proportional carbon emissions. It's almost the same map. With the exception of South Africa, it's nearly the same map. So there's been a direct coupling ever through the Industrial Revolution, basically until now, between emissions, energy use, and economic growth. It's only in the past two or three years that there are signs of decoupling between increased energy consumption and increased economic growth. 
In fact, Anthropocene, a magazine published here out of Seek, had an article in their last issue uh, basically suggesting and proposing that the United States is finally decoupling, that we're reducing our per capita energy use while our per capita GDP is increasing. So just in the past few years. Proportion of population in poverty. It's almost the inverse map. So we'll go back and forth here for a second. So proportional carbon emissions, proportion of population in poverty. And these numbers are a little bit old, but it's still the status quo. But things are getting better. You've seen, I'm sure you've, I've stolen this piece from Hans Rosling. I'm sure you've seen his much more dynamic TED talk, um, the, stat the Swiss, uh, Swedish statistician. But this is data of income and life expectancy. So life expectancy is linear and, and income is on a log scale over 200 years. And effectively, the trend is positive for every region and every country in the world, although you can see some incredible impact. So there's, that was the Second World War. You saw the First World War a couple seconds before that. Uh, but every country and every region in the world has been getting healthier and wealthier, although you still see a large cluster of African countries uh, behind. And I highlighted Rwanda in particular because our team has done a lot of work in Rwanda with colleagues in this room, and I'll come back to it. And this is the state of the world today. Um, these statisticians made the case in a book recently um, called Factfulness, and the Gates Foundation has, really, has recently adopted this new paradigm of dropping this idea of developing and developing developed countries. There's been lots of different euphemisms used over the years, uh, you know, third world countries or least developed countries or global north and global south. Uh, it's a little bit more boring, it doesn't roll off the tongue as easily, but it's more accurate to look at income levels. There are clear stratifications of income levels uh, and you do of course see clustering in the low level one. So it's a little bit <coughs> more challenging to try to succinctly describe uh, the conditions you're trying to address, but we're trying to adopt within the Mortensen Center either this framework or the UN adopted framework of low and middle income countries. Uh, for a variety of reasons, the main one being there's no such thing as a dichotomy between developed and developing. This is the global burden of disease in the world between high socio-demographic income countries, so rich countries, and low SDI countries, poor countries. And this is the, this is I think mortality, yeah, so this is mortality among children under five. So congenital defects or uh, neonatal issues will kill you if you die under the age of five in the United States or in Europe. If you're born in a developing country, you're at a much higher risk overall of dying under the age of five. And if you do, chances are it's respiratory disease or diarrhea or malaria which are environmental hazards. So that's the condition of the world. And the Mortensen Center and our research team and a lot of you are already engaged in trying to see how engineers can contribute to addressing these poverty challenges. But the status quo for most development efforts, and there's a lot, there's a lot, billions upon billions, tens of billions of dollars are spent every year, both formally and informally, in development programs. But the, it looks like this. Money comes in from a donor, from the World Bank, from UNICEF or USAID, or all the way down to a Rotary Club or Engineers Without Borders. But there's some donor putting money in to what programs that often have a technology component, water filters, cook stoves, biogas generators, latrines. Not all development efforts are technology-based, but many have a technology component to them. And these interventions are supposed to positively impact people's health and livelihood. The challenge is that long-term measured impact for many of these interventions is often hard to find. It's very short-lived. Roughly half of water and sanitation infrastructure that's installed every year in developing countries with foreign aid money is broken within the first 18 months. About half of infrastructure is broken at any given time. And it's partly because of the status quo. Well, their owners will pay for infrastructure there's an expectation that communities and nations pay for ongoing O&M, but the reality is massive service gaps. So how can we change this? How can we influence this system so that the impact in developing countries with partners is aligned to the payments and that we're able to sustain services? What we want to create is this more virtuous cycle where you have a service like a water pump 
you continuously monitor that service. You use that monitoring to prioritize and enable maintenance and other service to operation and maintenance activities. And you pay. You have money from communities, from governments, from uh, multilateral agencies tied to services. People are willing to pay for services, but they're much more willing to pay for reliable water services. So you can, in fact, have greater cost recovery when you professionalize and deliver better services. But also, there's probably a long-term role for aid. Now, there are a lot of people that work in the aid sector that will say, our goal is to work ourselves out of a job. We're only going to do the heavy lift of paying for the dam or the water pump or the borehole, uh, and countries have to pay for it. In reality, $40 billion a year is spent on WASH by foreign aid. We can help that money be much more cost effective. So our team has had a few different mechanisms for trying to influence this system. One is by creating commodities, things like carbon credits, health credits, development impact bonds, uh, other performance-based contracting that is ties payments to services that are delivered. And then the other is through improved monitoring. So our particular niche has been satellite and cellular connected sensors uh, that remotely monitor this infrastructure. So we've put sensors in water filters, cook stoves, latrines, on water pumps. We've used them on a sampling basis within impact evaluations and randomized control trials. And then we've also used them operationally uh, to try to influence day-to-day -day operations of services. And sometimes we're doing both of those at the same time. So here's a few different examples of where we've done this. Oops. Oops. This is getting a little messed up. Okay, broken hand pump. Uh, an engineer's instinct is I can build a better hand pump. That pump's not broken. The proximate cause is because those bolts sheared off. But really the ultimate cause, if you take a failure analysis framework, is that the system surrounding that pump failed. We are trying to influence that through improved monitoring. We put hundreds of sensors all across hand pumps in Western Rwanda a few years ago, and Chantal Urubigiza, who is here and is a PhD student in this department, at the time was the program manager for Living Water International. So she was the professional staff whose job was to make sure that these pumps stayed operating. So in fact, Chantal's team was the subject of our study. We put sensors on several hundred hand pumps in one group the pumps were treated to basically the ad hoc business as usual maintenance, which meant the implementer in the county or the district government would get around to maintenance when they could. The next group was a circuit rider model, which is considered the best practice in the sector, where there were dedicated technicians uh, with vehicles and supply chain whose jobs were to go around and fix hand pumps. And then the third group, and we had sensors in all these groups, but only in one, one of the groups, was the data actually made available to the implementer, to Chantal's team, who had a dashboard that they could see when a pump was broken. So we were passively monitoring two groups and then actively providing feedback on one. And it had a pretty dramatic impact on water system functionality. In the baseline, when a pump broke, it was broken for more than 200 days, so more than half the year, which is essentially the status quo in this sector as well. That's, a, that's about typical. The circuit rider model got that down to about 60 days, but only with the actual active feedback were we able to get that, or Chantal was able to get that down to 20 days. So almost order of magnitude improvement in water in, in response time, and moving the mean functionality from about 50% to 90%. The other thing is that it's cheaper to do this. Even with the added costs of things like sensors and supply chain and dedicated staff, if your metric is cost per person or cost per liter of water, it's cheaper to maintain than it is to go off and build new pumps all the time, half of which are broken in a few years. But the problem is, well, however self-evident that may be, it's not the status quo in this sector. We've been applying some machine learning tools to this as well. I'll be brief on this. But basically, we want to drive um, functionality to 100%. This is one, each dot here is one day of a functional pump delivering water. Using some reasonably sophisticated machine learning tools, we can actually see when a pump is in distress, when a water pump, uh, the tire pressure warning light for a hand pump, and deploy technicians during this period of time. That's almost a week of a pump working, delivering water, before it actually breaks. 
And using this technique, we've been able to demonstrate that 99% uptime is feasible without an increase in cost, because the maintenance activity was going to be required anyway. The pump is going to break anyway. You're just lowering that gap, shortening that window. Okay, next. Uh, Here's what we're doing most actively now within our research team, and this work also has overlays with the very large sustainable wash systems grant that Carl and Amy have that a number of you are involved in, uh, which is trying to improve functionality of services at scale in East Africa. We're currently monitoring about a million, 1.3 million people's water supply on a daily basis in Ethiopia and Kenya. So we've covered every single water point uh, in Afar, Ethiopia. We're expanding the Somali region now for all the emergency drought infrastructure. And we've covered all of the emergency drought infrastructure in northern Kenya. And by the middle of next year, um, we'll be monitoring about 5 million people's water supply daily. These are satellite connected sensors that every day are providing feedback on water point functionality, uh, repair intervals, water yields. Uh, we also compare it against other data sources like rainfall because there's, an, uh, you know, the, the demand for the groundwater in this region is inversely correlated to available surface water and rainfall. And we have a whole bunch of different users of this data. So we have the National Drought Management Authority in Kenya that pays for water trucking and they prefer to just keep boreholes running. We have UNICEF that spends a huge amount of money on drought relief and we would rather keep the boreholes running. We have the Afar Regional Water Bureau, whose job it is to maintain infrastructure functionality, but these places are so remote that they don't know if a system's broken or not. So they're our customer using this data to re reduce the maintenance intervals. This is sort of what it looks like. This is in Kenya. This is a five-year, $30 million program that we have a piece of operating all across northern Kenya. That's an example of a pump house. That's an example of actually a new system that failed within about a week and our sensor detected that this particular failure. And then this is Ethiopia, similar sort of environment, incredibly arid. People are nomadic pastoralists predominantly. Uh, historically, they've relied on surface water. People keep their wealth in their uh, camel herds. And even within the, you know, within short period windows here, over the past couple of years, you can see people switching from camels to goats because they're more resilient to climate change. So this is a place where climate change is being felt in very real terms. And here's a few other examples of our operating context in, in Kenya. Looking at data that we had from about a million people's water supply over 18 months, we worked with uh, the NASA SEVERE program to look at satellite connect collected rainfall data, so that's shown in blue, against our borehole data. And it's most obvious here in Kenya, although the trend was identical. Um, there's an inverse correlation between rainfall and groundwater demand. It's actually, it's kind of obvious, but the scale of the data we've collected is pretty phenomenal. And they independently had basically the same result, which is that if there's been rain in the previous week, there's a 20% less use of borehole water. Now that's just kind of an FYI. What this really means is that when there is no rainfall and there's no surface water, the boreholes become the primary water source. And when those boreholes are broken, it leads to these emergency conditions, which can be quite severe. Okay, moving out of the borehole world, groundwater world, I'll give another example of where we've used some of these techniques. This is uh, a Rwandan household. 80% of Rwandan homes are rural, and 80 to 90% of primary fuel use in Rwanda is biomass on open either um, clay stoves or three stone fires. And air quality from air quality issues associated with biomass burning is the leading cause of illness and death in Rwanda. The second is diarrhea associated with, with water and sanitation. And people in Rwanda, typical rural Rwanda, typically get their water from these types of hand pumps again. So, out of a program that actually originally started, oops, frozen here. Okay, out of a program that originally started here at CU Boulder with Eng who's involved with Engineers Without Borders or has been involved. So, uh, back in 2001, actually, sorry, it was 2002, we started getting involved in Rwanda. And it grew from a very small EWB project funded by Rotary Clubs and fundraising activities to what over a 15 year period became a nationwide program. Uh, we're, oops, I'm totally frozen. Hold on. 
where we were able to distribute over 350,000 cook stoves, high efficiency cook stoves, and over 100,000 water filters, covering 1.7 million people in total. Uh, this is in 7,500 villages, 350,000 households, 1.7 million people, and all entirely privately financed. So we had private, we had private funding uh, from a company to support distributing these stoves and water filters. And the business model, I'm gonna have to keep ad-libbing, this thing is totally dead. Um, the business model was to continuously monitor the intervention, monitor the stoves, monitor the filters, and earn carbon credits under the United Nations tied proportionally to ongoing use and function of the water filters and cook stoves. Uh, we were the first to come up with this idea and apply it to water treatment. We did it first in Rwanda, moved that to Kenya, and then brought it back to Rwanda. Um, the model was effective. The problem <coughs> is there were two big problems that came out of this work. One is the, stand, the monitoring standards that are required by uh, the carbon credit authorities are much lower than the standards that academics or researchers require. So there was actually a big gap between what auditors would say was happening within these types of interventions, and not just ours, and what the level of proof that an RCT would give you. And so as a result, there's quite a bit of controversy in this sector about the appropriateness of using things like carbon credits for funding water and cook stove interventions. Since that time, there's been a few other responses. One, in our program in Rwanda, we brought in uh, Tom Kloss from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Tom's now an advisor for the Mortensen Center. He's the leading expert on water filter evaluations. He now has a $30 million grant from the NIH to do the definitive cook stove evaluation. So his team was the right team to evaluate our program. Um, and then further, there's been other new mechanisms that have emerged in the past few years to try to pay, to incentivize implementers uh, on a performance basis. So for example, there's things called A daily credits, averted disability adjusted life years, which are credits that are proportional to an estimate of health impact, uh, which you can earn from a, from, a water, from a cook stove intervention without necessarily measuring health. You measure proxy indicators, you measure use, performance, efficiency, and personal exposure to particulate matter, and from that, you can uh, earn health credits that you can monetize and sell. So there's been other new interventions that have come in to, uh, or innovations that have come in to try to pay for performance. Another good example of this are our colleagues at Bridges to Prosperity, who are gonna be putting pedestrian footbridges all over Rwanda. They've typically done that with private donors, giving them money to do one bridge at a time. Has anybody been involved with Bridges to Prosperity? Uh, now, they've created a development impact bond or a performance bond that B2P will use private investors to go build the bridges. The Morrison Center will run the evaluation of if those bridges are impacting health and household income. And a bond buyer will pay B2P not based on the completed bridge, but based on actually proving that they've had an economic uh, impact in communities. So this is a huge new sector in development that's trying to move towards performance-based payments. Okay, is that a sufficient ad lib to get me back on track? <laughs> the entire eastern province and the yellows areas were the control sectors for the RCT. That's the stove, high efficiency cook stove. Uh, reduces wood fuel use considerably, doesn't reduce air quality enough uh, to have a health impact by, by most measures although the water filter had a phenomenal health impact, uh, but again, has to be paired with extensive behavioral messaging. So while these are technology interventions, this is a public health program. And so the program was driven by public health theory and methods and public health professionals, and the technology was subordinate. Technology has to work, but it's really not sufficient. We had about 4,000 community health workers working nationwide with us, and this is the type of uh, materials that we've developed. So this has evolved since then to a new program that Abby's getting involved in and Laura's getting involved in, where the Gates Foundation is taking what we know about how to promote household water treatment, and we're incorporating that into a standing Ministry of Health program for uh, hy they're called community hygiene clubs. So we're taking these learnings and applying them forward in Rwanda. One other thing we did was use sensors. We put sensors inside stoves and filters to try to directly measure use. 
it's a big messy middle in public health interventions where engineers can design stoves, filters, bed nets that work. Uh, public health people have a pretty decent way, epidemiologists can measure health impact, pretty sophisticated tools. Not very sophisticated tools for measuring use or compliance or adherence, whatever you want to call it. Same type of water filter, stove or latrine or bed net in similar contexts. While say every high reported adoption, people tell you they're using them, even however fancy you get with your survey tools. Um, if you pay somebody to sit there and take notes when people use a stove or filter or latrine, really high level of compliance, and yet widely varying health outcomes, which up till recently has tended to implicate the technology. Oh, water filters don't work, or household water treatment doesn't work. When it appears, based on data we've collected, that the bigger challenge is whether or not people are really using the interventions. So to try to address this within our program, we hid sensors inside our water filters. And in one arm, people knew the sensor was there. And in another arm, they didn't know the sensor was there. And this is the uh, impact we saw. Use the epidemiologists, using the best available WHO survey tools, reported that people use about a liter and a half of water per person per day, which is exactly the correct answer. And when people know a sensor's in their household, they're only using about a liter of water a day. When people don't know there's a sensor in their home, they're only using about half a liter a day. So there's two things happening here. People are reacting to being monitored, even if passively monitored, and this persists for a month, more than a month. And there's biases in the reporting. The only time that our survey data has actually matched our sensor data is during the periods of time in the day that surveyors are there. So it's not that surveyors are Christmas treeing their reports, they are inducing the behavior. So based on that RCT, we doubled the number of households with clean water, reduced indoor air pollution by 70%, reduced diarrhea by 30%, but also reduced seroconversion, which is a blood indicator of exposure to cryptosporidium, by 48% among children under five. Uh, so these are probably conservative numbers. We also reduced respiratory disease by 30%, which is surprising because most other cook stove interventions haven't seen this type of impact. We didn't have independent arms. We didn't have cook stoves over here and filters over here and both over here. It was a combined intervention. So the best we can say about this is either by being healthier from reduced diarrhea, uh, you're more resistant to respiratory infections. And or we were effective at getting people to cook outdoors. And so while personal exposure didn't reduce uh, directly, indoor air pollution did. And that would have impacts on the non-cooks. Um, but we can't disaggregate that. And then we're also able to estimate both morbidity and mortality associated with the intervention. Another place where we've taken this forward, and Chantal's involved in this study, is within this very large scale NIH and Gates funded program called HAPPEN. Uh, it's 2018, and we actually don't know how healthy you can get if you don't use biomass stoves. The HAPPEN trial is funded by NIH and Gates, led by Emirates in four countries Rwanda, Peru, Ecuador, uh, no, Rwanda, Peru, Guatemala, uh, and Ro shoot, in India. That's the fourth one. Uh, in India, over five years, and the, as an efficacy trial, they're paying people, they're giving away free LPG stoves, free LPG, whole bunch of other treats, lots of follow-up, visits every single week. Uh, they're taking ultrasounds from pregnant women, they're following children from, children from minus six months to age five years. It's a everything in, and the kitchen sink effort to establish the maximum benefit of clean cooking, which will be the point, the dose response point on the curve that no intervention ever reaches again. Our piece of this puzzle is to use PM 2.5 sensors that are actively monitoring indoor air pollution, provided as feedback to households using this pictogram of a child's lungs with also the implication of the environmental benefits. This was a human-centered design process that Chantal led uh, to come up with both the triggers and the message. So you get persistent feedback on current air, air quality, and then if we detect a baseline stove use, it plays music, plays these Rwandan drums. It's basically an incredibly expensive smoke alarm. And our study is to see if this kind of data can encourage exclusive use of a, of a LPG stove. Okay, last thing, sanitation. 
We've also used instrumentation within sanitation interventions, both operationally and as part of studies. This is Sanergy Inc. Has anybody worked with Sanergy? They're one of our practicum partners. Um, Sanergy has about 800 of these franchise toilets across uh, Nairobi in two different uh, informal settlements. And their business model is they provide the latrine, they service it every day. Uh, franchisees buy, buy the latrine, but then charge for use. Sanergy wanted us to help them optimize their service area and their maintenance interval or their service intervals because they were losing money on servicing every day. So we put sensors inside them that included RFID tags. The sensors would estimate fill rates, so service intervals for the latrines. The RFID tag could use, be used by the franchise owner to request service, like an out of schedule service. Uh, and the waste collectors would be required to scan their badge to mark a service interval, to mark a service event. And we integrated all of this within Salesforce. And we were able to optimize and demonstrate the optimization of these latrines, although it wasn't cost effective. The sensors are expensive. Um, it was still cheaper to just pay people to visit every latrine every day. The other places where we've used these are across a number, about eight different <coughs> Gates-funded uh, health trials of latrine interventions in India and Bangladesh. Billions of dollars have been spent by the Indian and Bangladeshi governments, by the Gates Foundation, by aid, on trying to reduce open defecation in India and Bangladesh, and in areas where it's a cultural norm. So it's not shameful, it's totally okay, but we also know it's a big disease vector. So it's a big contributor to the burden of disease. There's an article in the New York Times a couple years ago uh, out of one of these trials that said, latrines in India do not improve health. And it was missing a couple words because what we've seen across all eight of these studies and thousands and thousands of latrines that we've monitored is that what people say they do is not really what they do. The only time, again, that the actual behavior matches uh, what people say is when enumerators are there watching. And the other thing is that it's just a huge error bar. Some people are over-reporting, some people are under-reporting. There is no decent survey tool for estimating compliance with latrine use. Okay, that's it, I'm exhausted. Um, <laughs> that, that's a cross-section of our project, some old ones and most of those are current ongoing activities. Any questions? Yeah, thanks. Chirps. So Chirps is the uh, was developed by. There's a program funded by NASA and USAID called Severe, and they've got five regional hubs around the world. One of them based in Nairobi, uh, that are essentially GIS and remote sensing experts trying to take remote sensing data, which is produced by NASA and the European Space Agency predominantly, and apply it or develop tools for countries that don't have that kind of data resource. One of them is Chirps, which is a station corrected rainfall estimate that's been that's also used by a bunch of other things including the famine early warning network to look at crop yields and project uh, project yields and est and and forecast famine so and chirps is a rainfall estimate that's one of their main indicators Do you have an it's four kilometers yeah so in our data it's we pick the nearest pixel to where our borehole is but as you saw on that map, we actually have huge geographic coverage of our sensors at this point. We're expanding this work now with FuseNet, because even though the premise of FuseNet and Severe is that many developing countries don't have local data sources like weather stations, uh, so this is a way to augment that, but all remote sensing is much stronger when it's ground truth. So our data is a ground truth source for these services now, or we're working on that. We're starting to work with them on that. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, you talked about um, carbon trading and health credits, mm -hmm. carbon credits and health credits. How do the health credits work? I've heard that model before. Yeah, so the idea is there's only basically one implementation of this now, and it's for cook stoves. And uh, it came out of Berkeley where there was one, there was one really mega cook stove study that was done in Peru called Respire over multiple years, and they developed the dose response. So personal exposure to PM2.5, what's, how's that, what's your response and health impact? And it's a really steep curve. 
So you really have to reduce emissions considerably before you start really accruing health benefits. Uh, Berkeley took that model that they developed and created a tool where anybody can go in and input their study, their cook stove, their location, their compliant and adherence rate, and personal exposure, which is an active measure. And it'll kick out a daily estimates. So one a daily, one disability adjusted life year is one person not being sick for a year, or 12 people not being sick for a month, or 24 people not being sick for a week, right? And, um, and two weeks. <laughs> uh, and then the gold standard, which is a voluntary trading mechanism that got started using carbon credits, created a methodology that says, we will then issue you, implementer, a daily credits, so you get these 100 a dailies because you proved this health impact, then you gotta go sell them to somebody which can be the, the World Bank has been a buyer of A-Daily Credits. Uh, there are foundations that are buyers. It's not that sophisticated a market yet, but the idea is towards a commodity that pays based on measured performance. Some of that has been superseded by taking conventional contracting, performance-based contracting like bonds, <coughs> and applying it to this context. 